Masood, how are you doing, sir? Uh, just maths is fine. I'm doing great. Hope you are, too. Oh, we're doing absolutely wonderful. We're just totally honored to have you on the line. Joe has been gushing like crazy, so you must have done something good in his class. Okay, so Mass, welcome on. Uh, welcome aboard here to the uh, show. Glad you could find Thank some you. time to call in here. Uh, yeah, I just went down a rundown of uh, just uh, your history, just a very brief uh, description of that. Um, one of the things uh, we were talking about, in uh, San Diego County, we were just able to get our concealed carry rights back. And uh, through the efforts of San Diego County gun owners, and we had a lot of help, we were able to persuade our sheriff um, to start issuing. So for the first time in decades, now citizens can get their concealed carry here in San Diego. And um, kudos, I was, kudos to you and the sheriff for doing that. Yeah, it was great. And the sheriff's uh, really doing a good job now. Complete 180 turnaround on, on their whole approach to things. And I was telling the folks, uh, I took your MAG-20 class um, last year up in Covina. And yep. it was just fascinating. The, uh, you know, I took the classroom part of it. And just the, the discussion and the information you put out on the legal aspects of this, of, uh, you know, carrying concealed and if you're involved in an incident and the stuff that goes on. And I was going to ask, could you talk a little bit about that, just briefly what you cover in your MAG-20 class, and then um, the stuff that the Masada U group, um, you know, offers training-wise? Sure. Uh, basically, we teach every year in uh, California, usually in Sacramento. Uh, we did the class in San Diego County last year and may do one of those in the future, though we don't have one scheduled. Uh, on the legal side of it, the, uh, the handling the aftermath, the big problem is historically we ask a, a lawyer, hey, what do we do if we're involved in a shooting? And the lawyer tells us, shut up, shut up, shut up, wait till I get there, tell him you want a lawyer and say it over and over again. And the problem with that is, your typical defense lawyer has spent his life dealing with people who are, in fact, guilty to some degree of, of a crime. The advice he, that becomes second nature for him is don't say anything to the police, because if the person is culpable, anything they say is either going to be a lie that's going to make things worse uh, or uh, going to be a confession. The problem is when you've done the right thing, uh, following the bad guy's advice, the, the advice you give to a guilty man. Essentially, you're getting the advice for guilty men that comes from a guilty man's lawyer, and it's probably going to start you on the way to a guilty man's verdict. Uh, I've, I've come to call it a uh, false positive effect. And when I say that, uh, usually the term is used in medicine. Uh, let's say you or I were suddenly stricken acutely ill, and they rushed us to the emergency room. Uh, we're obviously in a life-threatening crisis, and let's say we're exhibiting every symptom that the medical texts and the collective experience of the, the medical people associate with disease A. We can expect they're gonna diagnose us for disease A, and they're going to treat us for disease A. If, however, we instead have disease B, and the treatment for A is contraindicated, uh, for a B patient, and they lose the patient. Well, in the medical world, that's called a negative outcome. In our world, it's called innocent person being charged with murder and manslaughter. And to see how that works, let's come out of the emergency room and out in the street. Uh, let's say tonight one of your listeners is violently attacked. Uh, they have a permit to carry a gun and defend themselves, thank God, and they do. Uh, the bad guy is down hemorrhaging, maybe screaming, he's dropped his gun. From the first responding officer on, their collective experience has been at a shooting scene, unless it's officer involved. Whoever is laying on the puddle of the blood generally turned out to be the victim. Whoever was standing there with a the smoking gun generally turned out to be the perpetrator. The actual perpetrator that your listener has defeated is now laying in a puddle of blood doing a remarkably convincing imitation of a victim. Your good guy is standing there with a smoking gun. What's the first correlation of symptom to diagnosis? Now, in their history, every genuine victim that they've ever talked to when they said, what happened, said, that SOB did such and such to me, and I'll testify against them in court. Mm -hmm. And just about every guilty SOB they ever arrested, and they said, buddy, we're happy to hear your side of the story, he said, I ain't telling you nothing until my mouthpiece gets here. <laughs> the guy who shot is laying on the street, and maybe his last words are, he shot me. 
for nothing. Bah. And they ask you, what's your side of the story? Uh, I want a lawyer. I'm not talking to you without a lawyer. Well, what do you think is how the symptoms are going to be read? What do you think is going to be the diagnosis? What do you think is going to be the treatment? And that seems to happen uh, far too often when somebody has to defend themselves that they actually uh, quite possibly get the finger blank, blank, or, uh, finger pointed at them. And what, what we want to do is we want to just want to go to a quick commercial break and we want to continue this conversation on the other on the other side of the commercial break. Can, can you stay with us? Absolutely. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, we're going to take a quick break, folks. Don't touch that dial. FM 96.1, AM 1170, The Answer. Welcome back. You're listening to FM 96.1 AM 1170. The answer. Hey, what's the best defense for self-defense and those horrible new red flag laws? Firearms legal protection. Mike, Lance, Joe, and I use them. Firearms legal protection is a legal defense program for lawful gun owners with a 24-7 emergency hotline and plans designed specifically for the firearms owner. Talk to the good folks at Firearms Legal Protection today. That's Firearms Legal Protection at FirearmsLegal.com or call them 469-310-9100. California's assault weapon laws make it almost impossible to own an AR pattern rifle. And what is the solution? It's Cali Key. It'll convert any mil-spec direct impingement AR platform rifle into a straight pull-bolt action rifle so it can have all the features without being considered an assault weapon. It's a true drop-in solution. No milling, no aesthetic modification, and no turning off your gas system. Keep your entire AR collection intact at a price you can afford. That's Cali Key. K-A-L-I-K-E-Y. K-A-L-I-K-E-Y dot com. You know, home, mor- home mortgages interest rates have dropped to yet another low. And if you're looking to buy or refi, or if you're considering a reverse mortgage, call a local mortgage guy that you can trust. Call Chris Wiley at PRMI Mortgage. For nearly 25 years, Chris has been helping local San Diegans with all their mortgage needs. Call Chris at 619-722-1303 or go to primerez.com backslash alpine. All right. So, Joe. Okay, so we're back. Uh, so, Mas, could you uh, continue uh, on your thought there? Well, I tell folks you don't want to spill your guts and start babbling because you've got to get some things wrong. Uh, when when you've been through a near-death experience, you're the worst person in the world to be answering questions like how far apart were you, exactly how long did it take, exactly how many shots were fired. What you do need to do is establish a baseline. So since the early 1980s, I've been teaching what I call a five-point checklist, and I'm happy to say a lot of other teaching organizations have adopted it. Uh, the five points are first... The first thing I would want to say if I had been an innocent like that and once the police arrived was explain the active dynamic. And the active dynamic is not that you shot an attacker. The active dynamic is what he did that forced you to shoot him. This man attacked me or this man attacked my spouse or whatever it was. Second, indicate that you will cooperate, that you will sign a complaint, uh, words to that effect. I'll testify against him in court, something like that. You are confirming you're the good guy, and he's the bad guy. Third, for God's sake, point out the evidence. Uh, People who don't work in law enforcement or emergency services don't realize how ephemeral evidence is at a scene of violence. Uh, In minutes, the the place is going to be literally trampled by emergency emergency medical service personnel, police officers, uh, spent casings, for example. Uh, somebody simply kicks the spent casing. They're not going to notice that they kicked it, but it goes skidding down the sidewalk. And later it looks like, uh, oh, gee, the gun was fired from point A, not from point B, where the defendant says it was. Uh, with the spent brass, 380, 9mm, 40, 45, is just the right size to get caught in the treads of the emergency boots that you see police officers, paramedics, and firefighters wearing. Sometimes it literally walks away from the scene. Sometimes as they continue to walk and the sole flexes, it deposits the spent casing some distance from where it actually originally was. Hmm. Uh, we've had wow. cases of bystanders picking up spent casings uh, as souvenirs. And and that throws a wrench in the works. That, that'll actually uh, work against somebody or... or 
or throw off a case. Yeah, and that's that's just one element. If the guy dropped a knife, tell the cops he dropped a knife, here's where it is. Somebody's going to pick the damn thing up and walk with it. Fourth, point out witnesses. Uh, the I don't want to get involved syndrome that was identified in the early 1960s uh, is still with us. There's a whole lot of folks who figure I don't want to have to lose time in court going to testify. And if you don't identify them, they're going to leave the scene, and their testimony that would have proven you were telling the truth is going to disappear with them. Finally, the fifth point of the checklist, it would be at that point that I would respectfully stop answering questions and say, Officer, you're going to have my full cooperation after I've spoken with counsel. I need to call my attorney now. That's amazing. And a lot of that is 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 counter to all the... You know, all the myths, everything that you kind of hear, like, oh, don't say anything until, you know, everything you see in a, in a movie or m- maybe you hear on, uh, you know, uh, a TV show or something like that. But that all makes a lot of sense and is extremely interesting. Well, the reason for that is I've, I've been working as an expert witness in this type of case since 1979. I've been a cop longer than that. I spent two years as uh, co-vice chair of the Forensic Evidence Committee for National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. So what I'm saying, Mike, I know a hell of a lot of defense lawyers. I've talked to guys who went a 30-, 40-year career and told me they felt they had never defended a truly innocent man who wasn't at least guilty of some lesser-included offense. Uh, Most of them will tell you it's extremely rare. It's uh, probably the upper 90th percentile of people who end up being arrested and accused are, in fact, guilty. That's why so many of them plead. If their whole experience has been it's a guilty guy. Talking to the police will do him no good and will probably harm him. It becomes their default. It becomes their reflexive advice. And it's not the right advice for that rare Perry Mason kind of client who is innocent, mm-hmm. did the right thing, but whether it's someone got the wrong impression, whether it's a political prosecution, and God knows we've all seen those, um, if they don't immediately at the beginning establish, look, here's what happened, here's what you need to look for, Nobody else is going to do it for you, and it's really going to give your defense lawyers an uphill fight as things go forward. So, Mass, based on your experience, do you find, because you do a lot of court-related stuff, a lot of cases, basically, with self-defense issues, do you find that um, a lot of self-defenders are are pretty well prepared and they've taken the time to learn and to train and and to kind of do things right to to have a good, you know, a good chance when they get in there to be able to defend themselves or be able to help their... um, lawyers defend themselves? Because I know just uh, generally speaking, statistically, concealed carriers are a pretty well-behaved bunch. Um, They've got a pretty good record in terms of not getting in trouble. But when they do get involved in a self-defense incident, uh, again, do you find that a lot of them were knowledgeable or a lot of them were uh, lacking in that? I find generally they won because they were prepared. Uh, They knew this might happen and they were ready for it. And that's why they won the fight. A whole lot of folks haven't thought beyond that. Uh, A whole lot of training classes that I've been to never mention it. One of the most famous self-defense classes uh, had one sentence. The the founder and lead instructor would say, if you want to know when you can shoot somebody, talk to a lawyer. I'm here to teach you how to win a gunfight. Hmm. And if all you've heard is the the old BS of never talk to the police, blah, 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 you're going to have a problem. Uh, The single biggest mistake, most common mistake I see made, the armed citizen does everything right. And as you know, you've studied this stuff, the great majority of times, no shots are fired at all. The bad guy sees the gun, they they realize they're about to suffer what I've come to call a sudden and acute failure of the victim selection process, and they run. And that's fine. The, The good guy did everything right. And then they holster their gun, and they sigh a sigh of great relief, and don't think to call the police. Mm, Yeah. Somebody across the street saw them pull a gun on somebody, then they got into their car, and they wrote down their license tag. And the first one on the phone seems to always be the the most influential. It's absolutely true. And the reason is the whole justice system is geared on the assumption that the original complainant is the victim, the first person to call in. Whoever does not call in is the perpetrator. Now, it's counterintuitive to most people. They don't picture bad guys calling the police, but it happens all the time. Uh, if you've got your career criminal who's you know, been going through the revolving door of the criminal justice machine since he was a juvenile offender, he knows how things work. 
He's furious that you've been able to do this role reversal on him. He's going to hide his weapon. He's going to call the police. He's going to give them your description and say, this crazy guy pulled the gun, gun on me for nothing, and I'll press charges. He has become the complainant. You have become the suspect. And the first question you're going to get was, if you did the right thing, why didn't you call in? Gee, a crime was being committed against you, felony aggravated assault, attempted on property, and you failed to report that felony, and you're telling us you're the good guy? And that doesn't ring true to the investigating officer, and it doesn't ring true to your typical juror either. Well, one of the things we've done is, you know, it's kind of a unique uh, situation in San Diego where we have hundreds of thousands of, of gun owners and people that shoot regularly and go to the range. And, you know, they've they've been experienced shooters for, for decades and are now have the ability to get a CCW. And when we ha- we, we've started a series of classes where we just teach people how to get through the paperwork to get a CCW. It's not that bad, but, it, you know, it's not needs a little instruction. So we've we put on these classes. And one of the things we emphasize a lot is, hey, this isn't about marksmanship anymore. You know, for 10, 20 years, you've been shooting at a piece of paper in a lane. You're going to be able to hit the, you know, a three by five card at 20 yards or whatever, you know, not a problem. Um, It's all the other stuff. It's where where can you carry? When can you use a, a firearm? And no matter how good you are at pulling from concealment and getting two shots on target, um, it's all this other stuff that that are these enormous bear traps, and uh, I, I don't that's know. And that, that's why we do a twenty-hour class on just that stuff. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, and and no one's taken into consideration. This might be your first time pulling your firearm and using it, so you're not going to be calm, cool, and collected. I wouldn't think. What What, what do you think, Moss? Well, you are calm, cool, and collected enough to beat a predator at his own game. Yeah. I talk to people who tell me, oh, I'll never remember those five points. I tell them, okay, you're walking around carrying a loaded gun in public. <laughs> you can't remember five things. <clears throat> Let's think about this. Yeah. When you draw the gun, how many things are you doing? Right. Remember to clear the cover garment. Remember to take a firm high-hand grip. Remember to keep your finger off the trigger. You Remember to release the uh, whatever device you might have had that's securing the gun in the holster. You Remember to rock and lock. You Remember to bring it up to line of sight. If you could remember that, it's because you've done all the repetitions, mm-hmm. you've visualized yourself doing it. Now what you need to do is prepare yourself mentally for what you're going to do afterwards. Mm-hmm. It ain't that tough. Wow. All so right. so let's keep... Yeah, we're going to keep you some more because you just messed up. You shouldn't be as good as you are because <laughs> now we're going to let you have another 15-minute segment. Can you hang with us? Absolutely. You are the man, brother. FM 961 AM 1170. The answer. All right, folks. Hey, welcome back. You are listening to Gun Sports Radio, FM 96.1, AM 1170. The answer. Hey, folks, have you ever been to A.O. Sword Firearms in El Cajon? Holy moly. They got the widest selection of guns in San Diego County with over 600 unique guns in stock, including hundreds of used guns. Go see their full-service experience gunsmith. They can do everything from mild repairs to full custom firearms. A.O. Sword Firearms Store, located at 929 East Main Street in El Cajon. Go to their website at aosword.com or call them at 619-749-4867. Build, buy, or repair. A.O. Sword Firearms is where you need to be. 619-749-4867 or aosword.com. Hey, folks, normally John Dillon would be calling in, but he's right in the middle of a deposition, I think. I don't know. So this segment's brought to you by Gatsky, Dillon, and Balance. LLP, your first stop if you ever get into any kind of a problem with a firearms law. Go to cafirearmslaw.com. That's cafirearmslaw.com. All right, Joe. Okay, so um, you know the other day I got my uh, my latest issue of America. Wait a Who you got on the line? I'm on the line. No, <laughs> you want to introduce them since we just came back? So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, what the heck? Okay, so we still have uh, Mass Ayub on the line, one of the legends of the firearms world. And we've been talking to him here for the uh, last couple of segments. So uh, we're going to continue because he's uh, such a great guy and has offered to stay here and talk to us. 
So um, what I started to say was I got my latest issue of uh, American Handgunner, uh, in which uh, Mass writes a couple of columns each uh, issue. And uh, he wrote a really, uh, really interesting uh, column on Doc Holliday and was talking about uh, some of the self-defense incidents that Doc Holliday was involved in. And um, a couple of concepts that actually uh, kept uh, Doc out of trouble with those things. And the two concepts he talks about is reasonableness and, um, and disparity of force. And those are two important concepts in modern day uh, self-defense uh, incidents and cases. And Matt, could you talk about those a little bit and exactly you know, what they are and then how they're used today? One of them, uh, he had shot a man in a bar who uh, turned out to be unarmed. And what saved him in court was many witnesses testified that the man he shot had uh, told Holiday and had told them that he was going to stomp Holiday, that he was going to kill Holiday, etc. When he saw him, uh, Holiday had uh, planted a gun at the behind the bar at the end of the bar and hung out at the end of the bar. And when the guy came in, turned on him with a hand in a pocket as if he had a gun. Holiday drew that weapon and shot the guy down. And the court held that he had, while well, the, the other man did not have a gun, it was a reasonable belief on Holiday's part when he took the action that he did. And then and now, that has been the standard for the cop and the, well, it has always been for the citizen. It wasn't really for the cop until the uh, Graham versus Connor decision by the Supreme Court in 1989. They said, in essence, you don't have to be right, you have to be reasonable. The standard for the private citizen is what would a reasonable, prudent person have done in the exact same situation, knowing what the defendant knew. For the police officer, it's slightly more rigid, according to Graham versus Connor. Uh, what would a trained, experienced police officer have done in the exact same situation, knowing what that officer knew at the time? So the reasonable man standard worked in that case for Holiday. So, so his opponent was somebody who would reasonably have access to a gun, who was making threats on his life, and who was pretending to have a gun. So any reasonable person, including Doc Holliday, would, would, would assume that, hey, this is all completely legitimate. He absolutely uh, could make, make, make good on, on the threats that he's uh, making towards him. So shooting him in that situation uh, would right. be considered defense. And it goes back to, remember, we were discussing the false positive in the first segment. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line is, if you waddle like a duck, if you quack like a duck, if you have feathers like a duck, <laughs> you will be identified as waterfowl. Yeah. And uh, the person who shot you essentially is going to be seen as the person you tricked into shooting him. It's interesting. Have you been to Tombstone, Moss? Oh, yeah. Loved it. Yeah, there's a, there's a did you see there's a whole... There. There is a lot of history. Did you see there's a, a hole in the wall there at, at, at that? There's a bar. They have a bar there. And in the back, there's a hole in the wall um, from a, a round from Doc Holliday's gun uh, is, is the claim. Lots of history. Yeah. Uh, while you're there, spend some time at the courthouse. They have all the original documents from the, uh, the hearing on that shooting. Oh, wow. Uh, including the diagram that Wyatt Earp drew for the court <laughs> of the shooting scene. Uh, the amazing. other point that you had brought up from Holiday's trials was disparity of force. Um, Doc Holiday died at 36. Uh, his young adulthood, he was plagued with uh, what they called then consumption, and we now know to be tuberculosis. Uh, at a time when he weighed 120, 130 pounds, uh, he was attacked by a 180-pound man. And his testimony was he was frail, he was fragile, he could barely breathe, and this person would have killed him if he hadn't uh, used a gun to defend himself. And the courts accepted that. The disparity of force principle has always been with us. Um, essentially, it means if, if your attacker is unarmed, if his physical capability to kill or cripple you is so great, uh, so much greater than yours to do the same to him, it becomes the equivalent of a deadly weapon on his side of the fight, and it warrants your recourse to a per se lethal weapon, such as a defensive firearm, to stop the attack. Hmm. Um, most commonly, it would be a, a huge disparity in size and strength, as was the case in Holiday's trial. Uh, it could also be uh, very commonly force of numbers. Your two or three unarmed men violently attacking you. As a general rule, male attacking female. 
uh, able-bodied attacking the handicapped, even if the handicap has taken place in the course of the instant assault. Uh, it could also be position of disadvantage. Uh, maybe you're as big and strong as the other guy or stronger, but he's got you up against the wall, he's banging your skull against a brick wall, and there's no other way to stop him. Uh, things of that nature. But you'll find uh, basically it, it becomes a uh, an affirmative defense in which the real world, the burden of proof does fall back onto the private citizen. You know, I, I, if, people don't understand how that works. Um, most states it would be, it will say in the law, once self-defense is on the table at trial, uh, the burden of proof now goes, as always, to the prosecution to show that it was not self-defense. However, what you've got here is two things going. First, for you to be able to get that in play at all, uh, for the judge to allow your attorney to utter the words self and defense in the same sentence, in a pretrial hearing, you're going to have to establish an element called uh, burden of production. Burden of production in this case means you have to show the court some corroborating evidence beyond just taking your word for it that it was self-defense, some physical evidence, some eyewitness testimony. So in burden of production, I think the operative term is burden right there. But the real reason it does shift the burden of proof, real-world jury psychology, all your witnesses have talked to people about this and have met the guy who doesn't, doesn't know the difference between murder and homicide. They think they're the same thing. They've heard at the opening of trial your attorney say, yeah, my client shot and killed him. They hear that as a confession of murder. In mm -hmm. real-world jury psychology, the burden falls on the defense to establish to the jury that this was, in fact, self-defense. Here's why. So real-world, go on the assumption you will literally be guilty until proven innocent. So th and this is something that just kind of occurred to me, and if, and if it's not a, 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 sp a specific case that you're, you've studied or are familiar with, then feel free to just you know say, hey, this isn't, it's not something I, I know much about or have, have studied enough to comment on something like that. But I think the biggest, most controversial uh, uh, defensive gun use case uh, in recent history, um, what are your impressions of, or what can you talk about, or what can you say about uh, the Trayvon Martin case? Well, uh, there's a long chapter in my book on that, and if uh, if your listeners uh, want to read my take on it for free, uh, go to backwoodshome.com. Uh, I'm the firearms editor for that publication, and uh, on their website, uh, on the main page, click on blogs, and then click on my name. Uh, they have the archives of my work going back to about 2007. Uh, they'll want to start on July 13, 2013. That was the day of the Zimmerman acquittal. And that's when I began a 20-part analysis of the case. Wow. I hadn't been able to discuss it prior because uh, early on in the case, uh, Craig Sonner, Zimmerman's first attorney, had uh, called me in as an expert witness for the case. And I felt it would be a conflict of interest to discuss it publicly until the verdict came in. Uh, but basically, we looked at it from the prosecutor's side, from the defense side, from the jury's side. And the bottom line of it is the jury had the right verdict. Uh, the hard evidence absolutely showed that Zimmerman was down. His head was being banged against the, uh, the concrete sidewalk. Um, Zimmerman said he had seen the gun become visible in the, uh, the waistband of his pants. And it said, you're going to die tonight as he reached for the gun. And as Trayvon Martin reached for the gun, Zimmerman said he slapped the man's hand away with his left hand, drew the pistol with his right hand, and fired the one shot that ended the fight. Uh, the hard evidence absolutely confirmed that. Uh, the hard evidence made it physically impossible for the state's theory that he shot uh, uh, Trayvon Martin while they were standing facing each other, or that Martin was down and Zimmerman shot him as he was on the ground that both of those theories were physically impossible. But unfortunately, the media had picked up on the whole thing. Well, one of the things that they, they picked up... day witch hunt. It really, it really appeared that way. One of the things that they picked up on that I still think is uh, misunderstood and, and is some bad information is that they started throwing around the term stand your ground. Uh, can you clarify or explain, did this situation, did this case have anything to do with Florida's stand your ground law? 
No, not at all. Uh, it's one of the most misunderstood pieces of legislation that there is. Uh, the Stand Your Ground law uh, simply is a rescinding of the retreat requirement that some states have, requiring you to retreat before using deadly force if you can do so uh, with complete safety to yourself and others. When you're down with a larger adult male, uh, Trayvon Martin towered over George Zimmerman, and he is smashing your head under the sidewalk, retreat is not an option. So just to be 100% clear, had the stand your ground law in Florida not existed, that case would have not gone any differently, correct? In my opinion, it would not have. Well, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Uh, by the way, I know George Zimmerman and I know his lawyers. Um, Marco Mario will tell you it was not a stand your ground case. Don West, the co-counsel, will tell you it was not a stand your ground case. And George Zimmerman himself will tell you stand your ground had nothing to do with it. It was straight up self-defense. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us for three segments. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the work you've done professionally. And uh, thank you so much. I think you and I actually have a friend in common, by the way, aren't you? You're, you, you, I think you speak to Mark Halcon out here in, in San Diego uh, yeah. with some regularity. How is Mark? He's doing great. He was actually one of the founding board members of San Diego County Gun Owners that got the uh, CCW uh, uh, policies changed out here. So he's he's doing great. He's 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 a wonderful guy. Please tell him I said hello and congratulations to you and all the uh, responsible gun owners out there, and to the sheriff. Uh, you did the right thing, and you mark my words, uh, it's going to save innocent lives. Well, we look forward to having you out here. Yeah, and we'll definitely get you back on again anytime you've feel that you've got some news that because we're the only gun show in california that i'm aware of so we've got a full-time job just you know we had to bump it from one hour to two hours just to be able to get all the information out there that the the second amendment gun owner needs just to uh, make right decisions and we appreciate everything you do that's great if any of your uh, listeners are interested in more information on us uh, the website is massadayoubgroup.com. That's M A S S A D A Y O O B group.com. All right, buddy. Hey, thanks, thanks very much and Thank Happy you. New Year. And we look forward to talking down the road. We wish you and your listeners all the best. Thank you, sir. All right, Without buddy. someone doing something about it, it's not going to get any better.